People should listen to the zip code plays because it is in the NTS tradition, we are calling forth a theatrical experience from the past and highlighting and illuminating how it can be done today. That anything we do as humans, any way we create art is never lost. It is only transformed or adapted but we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before and i think it's important we do not forget that there are so many artists that their only medium they had was radio and nobody thinks about them but now they are so i think these zip code plays do what antius does best which is call forth the past and say and now why now why do we need to hear this now we need to hear it now because we need to take this old art form that we've kind of forgotten about and bring it into the present to highlight what is going on in our world world today and in the way this project also highlights these zip codes in los angeles the historical precedence of these neighborhoods how they've changed how they've been lost or how they've remained exactly the same unbeknownst to anyone. Um, our history is important. And it, lest we forget where we've come from, whose land we're really standing on, whose, um, you know, whose hard work we are benefiting from. And we forget that. We get very caught up in our present day and the future, but we must remember where we've come from. So I think people need to listen to the plays just because they need to know like how cool Los Angeles is, but also how amazing radio plays are. Like just what you can really discern. Um, and maybe get off your screen for a while. Like maybe stop looking at this black mirror here and maybe listen and sit in space with someone, maybe listen together. My name is Ann Noble. I am an actor, playwright, director, arts educator, jail chaplain. I'm with Antias Theatre Company, and I'm the author of the zip code play Blue Like You, which takes place in the women's jail in Linwood, California. That's in Los Angeles. Please come to um, Antias to listen to it. And also, please listen to this interview if you want to know more. The story for Blue Like You uh, and Linwood came because um, I'm actually a jail chaplain. Um, so I have been visiting the LA County jails for, gosh, going on five years now. I've been um, part of a group called Prism Restorative Justice, which was founded uh, by two Episcopalian monks. Um, their monastery is called the Community of Divine Love. And I got involved with them through a very long security story through All Saints Church, through theater, through Boston Court, this amazing story. Um, uh, but I've worked with um, incarcerated youth for a decade doing a theater program through NTS Theater Company. Um, and I started going into the jails as a chaplain, just sitting with people, doing church services, doing spiritual work, reading poetry, creative work. Um, and it's a call. Um, I feel at home in the jails, which uh, is, may sound crazy to some people, but it's where I find it's just my home. And um, so when I've never written anything about my experience in the jails, I've written poetry, but not anything that's really, um, been in theatrical dramatic form and um when the zip code zip code plays started um i you know the zip code plays actually started because of ed napier that that writer i told you about that started the playwrights lab he was the one that came up with the idea of it and we did two versions of it back in person at antias a while ago and um and i participated in both of those um i wrote a play set in um uh in burbank and i can't remember where the other one was set um but i did burbank airport um and so i knew what the zip code plays were about and then when we decided to do radio plays for COVID, i thought oh this is brilliant um and i didn't submit initially to write one i was busy doing other things and then when the second round came about i pitched linwood i was like nobody knows that this women's jail is right in the heart of linwood 
and you know where the Rodney King riots were and and the women's jail was the first jail I went into um and I had a profound experience there um and so I've been going in there ever since and um I'm now one of the I'm the actual program director now of prison restorative justice the monks have moved up to San Luis Obispo, Obispo and um, are working in the jails and prisons up there. And so I'm working with a woman named Sharon Crandall now, and we run the program. And so I'm going to very shortly become the senior chaplain at CRDF, which is the women's jail in Linwood, California. And so in the zip code play, they asked for pitches for a zip code. I just, I, I was like, I have to, I have to write this, um, piece. And I wanted to write a piece about a mother and a daughter. Um, because in the women's jail, it's always that story. It's always a mother's incarcerated and her daughter's outside and doesn't understand, or the daughter is inside and the mother is outside and doesn't understand. And, um, I think we don't think about when we think about the incarcerated, we think about criminals we don't think um, about the life circumstances that may have led to some of that criminal activity. We also don't think about how it tears families apart and that um, what it means to a child to lose their parent to incarceration and how difficult it is to visit, to see, to contact, to reach out to an individual who is incarcerated. It is unbelievably difficult to remain in contact with them. Um, and everything's observed too. Everything's watched. So there's no private contact. Um, so if you just think about that, like think about what it's like to, um, you have something going wrong in your day and you can't have a private conversation with your mother or your sister or your daughter. It's always watched. And we know it. that's like a little bit, you know, our surveillance state we have right these days where everything's being listened to and watched, but we don't really think of it. But um, I, I felt I had to write about this because people don't know what's going on in there. Um, and while I can't speak to everything that goes on in there, I can tell a story. I can take the experiences I've had through the women I've met and I can um, highlight and maybe illuminate some of what goes on in there and who those people really are. They're people, actually. They're not the other. They're actually just people like us. And um, and so I, I felt it was important to illuminate what was going on in there and illuminate um, the courage I see, um, the humor I experience, and the sorrow. And I, uh, so that for me was really important. And I was just so grateful that, um, that, um, it was selected and chosen, um, um, to be a part of it. I was really excited. It's a, a mother who is incarcerated and, um, she's normally, um, visited by her mother. Um, every week or so the mother comes as a regular visit. And then this time, um, it's actually her daughter that shows up instead. And so it is a mother daughter reunion and they have not spoken for quite some time. And there are some very hard feelings and some misunderstandings. And it is a story that is about two women who should be connected or should be family who don't feel like family, but discover they are family. Um, and it also, um, part of the zip code plays mission is to highlight the zip code is to highlight this location in LA that maybe people don't know about. So it also talks a little bit about the history of Linwood itself, the city where this jail is sitting. And a lot of people don't know about, um, because the characters lived in Linwood as well. And so it's a mother daughter reunion, I guess is the best way to say it. It also, um, does highlight some of what goes on in the jail, some of the rules and what people have to deal with there. Um, and some of our misconceptions about what goes on in there, but it's all told through the eyes of um, uh, the mother and daughter, but the play is also set from the perspective of the mother. 
So a lot of people don't think about this, but um, in a radio play, you actually have to think about the camera. Where is the point of view? So in the play itself, you will hear that Mercy, the mother, she's clear. Her voice is clear. Her daughter's voice is through the visiting window and through the phone. So her daughter's voice is always different. It's not fully clear because we are in fully in the mother's point of view. So we are incarcerated in this episode. So it's a very subtle thing that not a lot of people picked up on, um, but it matters. Uh, again, a shout out to our amazing sound person, Jeff Gardner, who um, produces this whole thing and does all this stuff. He is adamant. He talks to all the playwrights and directors and actors. He says, "This we have to know what the point of view is. We have to know where is the camera? Where are we looking to? It matters with sound where the voice is coming from, where we hear it. Um, and because I directed one of the first zip code plays, I got the lecture. <laughs> I got the lecture about point of view in a radio play, which I had never thought about as a writer. And so I had a little pre-training. So when I sat down to write the play, I knew to make sure I had a very clear point of view, who was our lead character, you know? Um, and so I wanted to put it on the side of mercy, um, named that for on purpose. Um, but I wanted to put it in very clearly in her point of view so that we would have that feeling of what it feels like to reach out to our loved one and their voice is always a little different and never quite clear. And the sounds, those really oppressive sounds that are in the jail um, that people also don't think a lot about, um, you know, it sounds different. And, uh, and a radio play is an absolutely perfect way to highlight how foreign the environment is for someone who's on the outside. Jeff Gardner, our, um, who produces and does everything, all the sound, he, um, he's been a Foley artist and he's worked with LA Theater Works, so he knows how to do live sound, like in the moment, make things sound like what they sound like. Um, and he's done, you know, he's also done, I can't tell how many sound designs for, um, for theater around town here in Los Angeles and elsewhere um but he really creates a world and he invites the playwright to think about the world itself as well so he doesn't he does this beautiful thing where he is not something that's added on even though yes we record it and then he puts the sound in afterwards he invites the writer he's letting the writer create the world and then in, uh, enhancing it. So not so much he's like frosting on the cake, he's part of the cake. He very much is there to serve the piece and create the sounds and the quality of the environment to illuminate the play. So he is, I think, um, yes, he is another, his work is another character in the play, absolutely 100%. And um, he's just a master. He just knows how to do it, a sense of rhythm and timing, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, he's so helpful. He can tell you right away that that's something we can't do, or this is, yes, we can do that, or I'm not sure if we can do that, let's try. Um, he's an artist in the highest sense of the world word. Um, and then the director, um, uh, D Jonathan Munoz Pru, I have worked with him before. He directed a play of mine, a reading of a play of mine uh, at Courage Theater. And um, I was introduced to him through that theater company and we just got each other. We just got along. He gets my writing. I have a very, um, my plays appear to be just how people talk, but they actually have a very specific rhythm to them. And he gets that. And he is, he's just an extraordinary director. He is loving and firm and clever and brilliant. And he works so well with actors. He's just, he's, He's got that perfect balance, what I call the mothering instinct, that perfect balance where he can love people, but also let's do it better, you know, and he's just so wonderful. And it's a very short rehearsal time we have, and he knows how to work in that frame as well. Um, he's just, you know, he is also a brilliant artist and also um, just a total pro. Um, so when they selected this piece, um, I was asked which director I'd like, and he was the first name on my list. I wanted to work with him and he was available and said yes. Um, so that was just a joy. Um, the actors, Juana Martinez and Claudia Elmore. Claudia um, was in the reading that Jonathan directed of that play. So, and that's how I got introduced to her as well. 
Um, she also then, um, when I was casting for Antius, I brought her in um, and she was in our production of Caucasian Chalk Circle. She is, she's just a dream. She is just such a beautiful artist and um, funny and powerful and her voice is so beautiful and I just absolutely adore her. So that was um, what they say, a no brainer. Um, and then Quana, um, I've known Quana um, through Antius for years. Um, we actually um, were double cast in the same role in um, Hedda Gabler, produced back in the old space um, uh, at Antius in North Hollywood. Um, so we got to know each other. You know, when you double cast, when you're double cast with another actor on a role at Antius, which is how we used to do all our productions you get to know each other really well because you have to go through creating this character together and it can be hard. Um, so you, you really get to know each other. And I just, um, Kwana is, um, just such a powerhouse. She is, uh, but she's got this really soft, mushy heart and that it was just perfect casting for mercy. She's gotta be tough and strong. And, but she also just has this little mushy, soft heart that is just so beautiful. Um, and you know, she's just an, again, another pro. I just, I knew the plays, we don't have a lot of rehearsal time and we just need people who can bring it and can bring it quickly and powerfully and beautifully and professionally, but who have that heart that is going to make it so, um, that can bring that vulnerability. And I know people who can work really, really fast. And I know people who can bring the heart. It's sometimes you don't always find those two to go together. And we just found it. We, it was lightning in a bottle. Um, and when I got back the first, um, we, I'm, I was there for the first read through and it was beautiful. But then when I got the first rough audio recording, I was just, uh, I was so excited. It was just beautiful. And then um, everybody just came together so beautifully. I could not be happier with it. It's absolutely what I heard in my mind's eye that it would be. So the process was just, I was so blessed to have such incredible people. You know, for me, the difference between the radio play, the podcast versus an actual stage play, I mean, again, you can't see it. So you have to imagine it. Um, but I actually would, it has a slightly similar quality to writing a screenplay. Because when you write a screenplay, and I'm, I'm talking about the stage directions, right? The action lines. You have to write something that when people read it, so I'm not talking about what you'll see on the film. I am talking about when someone reads your screenplay, they have to read it and see it. So for me, I thought a little bit about when I write for film, television, new media, like, but they're talking it. It's not just, obviously you can't see the stage directions, but I thought about, I have to get people to see what they're saying. And so it, 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 that's kind of how I thought of it. Um, the difference is obviously you can't, you're not communicating the story visually in what we see. You're communicating the story visually through what you hear. So I really thought about how much words and then the lack of words convey so again you can't just talk about stuff like for me you know oh look at that pencil you're holding you can't do that right you can't you don't want to do that that's talking down to your audience but if you know your character says i'm gonna write that down and then you just hear this little scribbling of the pencil we'll know what it is so there's a trust of your audience you have to have and um i love words i love i will sit and listen to characters talk forever and i also when i even when i write my plays they're really more auditory than they are visual anyway um i'm not i don't uh think in a visual way like a julie tamor way that's not i don't think that way i think in how words carry meaning and um and not even words describing what we're seeing, just the way people talk, the way they run on their sentences and talk over each other and they're really, really fast and then they'll slow down because something happened or they stop talking and there's a silence. So for me, it was taking, really paying attention to rhythm, silence, 
and the tone of voice. So how people are talking, not just what they're talking about. And, um, and again, I think my skills as an actor, putting myself in the actual situation, like I act out all my plays when I'm writing them, I'll sit there and actually act them out. So I'll pick up the phone and talk. Um, and as Jeff Gardner told us, you have to, it, people are in space. We're just recording their voice. They're in space. And I think we don't realize how much we're conveying by the, our tone of voice and what we say and what we do. I mean, if you really close your eyes and listen, you pick up more, a lot more than you realize you do. You know, we're so dependent on our eyes, but we don't realize how much we're actually hearing. I think the Zoom world has actually highlighted that because the Zoom, even though we can see each other, the video quality is kind of flat. And sometimes you can't see people, but they'll go off video, but you can hear them. So um, I've taught a lot of acting over Zoom and people get very frustrated because they sometimes can't see each other. If they're looking at their script, they can't look at the other person. And then I say, well, why don't you listen? <laughs> why don't you listen to their voice? What do you hear? I encourage a lot of my acting students to do their rehearsals over the phone or to turn off their video and just listen. So for me, the difference was very subtle and it really wasn't that extreme. I felt it was sort of right in my wheelhouse um, because it's maybe again, because of my auditory nature, but it's how I like to write as a playwright. I like words to convey. I also, I guess it's a little bias I have for theater versus film. We can't compete with film in the theater. You know, we just can't, we can't set it in Arabia. We can pretend, which is its power. But so my feeling is why try? Let's watch what the human body is doing in space, how they're transforming the world around them, but their voice. And the, by the voice, I mean the whole body, but words, just words. I'm, I have a bias for it, I guess. So I think there, there's something in the theater about the human voice, the way we express our words and they become poetry. I think of it like we, you know, like I, one of my favorite musicals is Hamilton and I've never seen it. I've only listened to it, but I, I know there's amazing choreography. I do know that. And I know visually it's beautiful, but the auditory experience, I was fully immersed and I was fully there. So for me, um, using our words in rhythm and poetry and, um, telling a story just with words, I'm, I'm down. So I didn't feel it was that much different for me. I felt it kind of really settled in. There was a couple things I was like, Ooh, gosh, I have to think about how I'm going to do that. But again, because I knew the environment I was writing in, in a jail, I know what that's like. I know the sounds and you have to be very alert when you're in the jail. You can't just be hanging out. You have to be very attentive and your eyes only go one direction. So you have to listen. It's really important. So I knew that environment and I knew Jeff Gardner would be able to make it sound good. So um, that carried a lot of weight itself. Well, I hope when the audience listens to the play, I hope um, they maybe think a little differently about the incarcerated, about what that experience is like. Um, I hope they recognize themselves um, in their own relationships with their family. I hope um, it tenderizes their hearts a little bit. Um, I think those, you know, two things, if we can recognize ourselves in the other, we have a chance to not other the other. And so for me, um, the play is not there to say, you should go into the jails, you should, vote a certain way you should do something that i think you should do that's not my job my job is to hopefully allow the audience to recognize themselves in these characters or this situation and that that will open their heart which will then open their mind and their eyes or their ears to see and hear in a different way that for me is the only way anything's going to change because that inspires a human to start to make good decisions 
as opposed to this is what you should do. I really am not in the game here to tell anyone what to do. I don't think that's healthy. Then it's you acting out something you think I should, you should do because I told you to. And I don't think that makes for good human beings. I think what makes for good human beings is a freedom to choose wisely. And um, I think we only are at liberty to do that when we see ourselves in the other because if we don't see ourselves in the other then we're always under threat and when we're under threat we make very poor choices we make close-minded choices we make fearful choices but if we can open our circle a little bit then maybe we can make some braver choices we can maybe be willing to step out of our comfort zone maybe we could consider helping somebody that we didn't think about helping before or listening to somebody we haven't listened to before you know i think a lot of us oh i'll donate here and i'll donate there and that's important but i encourage everyone to go to the places you're donating to and to actually have a physical response and feel what it's like to be in a circumstance where you there that you've not been in before i that's what i hope um And that for me um, is the only way I've seen people change is when they feel, um, you know, the old Coleridge quote, what comes from the heart goes to the heart. And that's what I hope. I love listening to zip code plays. Um, First of all, just because I can listen while I'm stuck in traffic, right? Like I can actually just, I can listen anywhere, which is so beautiful. But I also, um, I love, you're just totally immersed. So the auditory experience is completely surrounding. Visual experience is only in front of us. You know, everything behind me right now, I mean, I can see it on my Zoom screen, but everything behind me right now is gone. It doesn't exist. Not until I do this. But auditory is three-dimensional. It's 360 degrees. It's immersive. And sound is very important to me. As I said, my vision is terrible. So for me, what I hear is so important. Um, And I also... I love that I'm not looking at something and I'm immersed in it. It's, it's, it's just so powerful to me. I also love listening to my fellow artists and what they come up with. I just like, I listen to some of these zip code plays. I'm like, I never would have thought of that. Like I would never write a play like that. That is amazing to me. Um, I also don't know a lot about these zip codes. I'm not from LA. And I think when a lot of people move to LA, they move to LA for the business. And so they get very um, uh, caught up in that. We get like on an agenda, on task. I'm here for my career. And we don't look at this incredible, beautiful city we have around us. Um, It's unbelievably diverse and exciting. And there's all these little pockets and corners. And because it's so spread out, we just don't go there. We tend to stay in our little safe neighborhood, our little clique. Or if we do go somewhere, we're going for an audition. And then we come back. And we don't have time to explore And so this project is offering people a chance to explore their own city that, you know, we get so busy, we just don't have time to. So I just, I love them. They are so funny and weird and unique and every single one is different. Even some we've had repeat writers, they're totally different. I just, it's incredible. Um, I love it. They're just, they're so beautiful. I love the way they're orchestrated too over a season. I, I really do try to listen to them in order and hear how they progress and how they've been put together. Um, and I love listening to Ramon who does the narration in between, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, he also worked with me with incarcerated youth for years. And, um, so he's a dear friend and I love listening to his contribution, um, and how they're really crafted all together you can listen to one but you can also listen to this whole evening of plays or afternoon as the day would go on um so i just i love it i absolutely love it and it's opened my eyes to things i did not know um about the city and about my fellow writers and all these other um some actors i've not heard of i've i was like who's that actor i didn't know them that's ridiculous i should know them um and also putting together the different actors like we have some actors in the company i've known for years so the one i directed the pacific palisades i know adrian harry nikki i've known them forever um and then to then hear 
actors together who've not known each other. So Quana and Claudia in my play, they've maybe met a couple times at Antias because Claudia did a show there and Quana's always there. Um, but they didn't really know each other. So they had to build this mother daughter relationship like that. And so that's also very exciting to me, putting together new actors who've not been together before. So um, yeah, I just love them. I'm so proud that we've done them. And it was such a wonderful thing to lean into during COVID, especially early on when we were, I mean, things are uncertain now, but it was so uncertain and we just didn't know what was gonna happen. It was such a beautiful place to lean into during those uncertain times and i'm just so proud of all of us for doing it i love them yeah i love them and people can listen all over the world i mean i have friends all over the world i can they can tune in and listen theaters like antius are well all theaters are so important because we need a place as humans to tell our stories and to tell them in a form because otherwise it just becomes a bunch of Facebook posts. So what we're getting in our world today through social media is a lot of uh, posting. So I'm expressing myself. The problem is my expressions are not being received in a way that I can actually experience. So I get little likes or thumbs up or someone screams at me back because they don't like what I said. And then it becomes an argument so we're broadcasting but no one's really listening in the theater it's not merely expression it's conveyance so as an artist i'm not as a human being i don't feel connected until i am experiencing conveyance expression is one thing i'm that is important but when it's received by another human being and i see it being received whether they like it or not, if they're like, ew, oh, wow, wow, why, why, ooh, why didn't you like it? That's when we feel human. And that's what a theater does. A theater is a place of conveyance of human expression. And if we are not experiencing conveyance, I think we die. I literally think we die. I think we starve and we die. And we turn into what we are experiencing in our world where we're yelling and no one's listening. And so because no one's listening, we yell louder. But when you are in a theater experience, a storytelling experience, someone's listening, someone's talking. And then after it's over, it switches. And the audience talks to the artist. I loved how you did that. I loved how you did that. And the artist is like, oh, interesting or interesting. It's an exchange. And we're not exchanging right now. We're just screaming into the void. And what a shock, we don't feel heard because we're not being heard. And a theater experience, again, forces exchange. We have to sit and listen to each other. And then you listen and then I listen, and then you listen and then I listen. And um, I think people are hungry for that and I think they're starving for that. So every local theater needs to be supported by the community because it's a place to go to practice that, to stay human, to stay present, to stay in the here and now. And theaters that have community, uh, communities that have theaters do better. They do better. People are kinder. There's less crime. There's more thriving. There's more sharing. There's more understanding. Wonder why. So I encourage anyone you have an extra 50 cents throw it at uh, your local theater go find your local theater it's there you don't realize it's there it's above the pet shop you know you don't know what are all those people with white pieces of paper outside talking to themselves oh it's a little theater it's a little studio go there see what's there you know it's so vital it's so important it's so important we're starving and we need to feed ourselves and that's how we feed ourselves. I'm Ann Noble and I'm a very proud member of Antius Theatre Company and it's Playwrights Lab and I encourage everyone to come and listen, antius.org. Listen to all the zip code plays, you will learn a lot about Los Angeles. And I would also encourage you to pay a little more attention to the incarcerated, to the houseless the people that are looking um, for homes out on the streets. 
and the people you may not have such a fine opinion of. I encourage everyone to practice deep listening. And um, you can find me also at prismjustice.org. That's Prism Restorative Justice. Um, we visit the incarcerated. And uh, I would invite you to come check that out. You might be surprised. <laughs>